Hello, and welcome to another episode of Vital Times, the CSA podcast. I am your host, Dr. Rita Agarwal. Today, we're going to continue talking about sexual and gender harassment and why it matters or should matter to everyone. I'm thrilled to be talking to three anesthesiologists with different backgrounds and areas of interest and expertise. Since my last podcast with Ms. Lautenberger, the author of the AAMC survey on sexual and gender harassment in academic medical institutions, which revealed that the highest levels of harassment were reported by departments of anesthesiology, there have been additional articles that reveal anesthesiologists have a higher incidence of burnout or burnout type symptoms than other departments and a higher incidence of intensity intention to leave their current institution. Intention to leave an institution was associated with more career dissatisfaction and was more common in women. In the AAMC survey, those faculty members, both male and female, who reported harassment had a lower morale less engagement and trust in the institution, less satisfaction with their work, and were more likely to want to leave. Since recruiting new faculty is costly and time consuming, it seems prudent to look for ways to retain current faculty and optimize their ability to grow and thrive. Harassment is only one part of a workplace culture that may be unwelcoming to some and hostile to others, but it is a very important part of that. And I am thrilled to have three distinguished guests to help us understand why it is important for all of us to combat gender and sexual harassment and to discuss opportunities and possibilities to make changes in local, institutional, and national policies. Dr. Sydney Thompson is the chair of the CSA's Women in Anesthesia Committee and the CSA's director for District 3, which includes Santa Clara County and extends east into the Central Valley and includes Stanford, where Dr. Burkhart and I are. Dr. Christine Doyle is the current ASA director representing the CSA to the National Society. She's a past president of the CSA and a member of the ASA's ad hoc committee on harassment, incivility, and disrespect. She is also a vice president for external affairs for the Santa Clara County Medical Association. Dr. Alyssa Burkhardt is the Medical Director and Chair of Bioethics at Stanford Medicine Children's Health. She is a member of the ASA Committee on Bioethics, and this spring she will be teaching One in Five, the Law and Politics um, and Policy of Campus Sexual Assault. We know harassment occurs. Today, we want to focus on what individuals, groups, divisions, departments, and more particularly institutions and organizations can do about harassment of any kind in the workplace. Welcome, Drs. Doyle, Burghardt, and Thompson. I'm going to start with Dr. Thompson. Can you give us a little background about how you and the CSA Women's Committee got interested in advocating for change in anesthesiology? Thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal, and it's a pleasure to be here today to speak about this issue. Just a little quick history leading up to our our creation in the CSA. Uh, In 2017, the Me Too movement exploded during the Women's March in D.C., and over 12 million women tweeted that they experienced harassment. And then quickly followed a consensus study report in 2018, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine published their research um, based on trying to find out why, with all the efforts being done to promote women in the STEM fields, that they were failing and they weren't seeing an increase uh, in numbers as they expected. And what they found in their publication, Sexual Harassment of Women, Climate and Consequences in Academic Science, Engineering and Medicine, that women were often being bullied, they were being harassed to the point that they either quit the field entirely, and if they did choose to remain in the field, their ability to advance and contribute was hampered, either from being directly harassed or working in an environment of ambient harassment. Basically, harassment was accepted. It was part of the culture. And many experienced retaliation and betrayal from formally trying to report episodes of harassment. And when you looked at these three sciences, 
medicine had the highest percentage of gender and sexual harassment. So as we moved along in the CSA, there was a recognition that there was a gender shift in medicine, yet women were underrepresented in leadership positions across practices in the state of California and nationally, and especially in our state and national professional societies. And workplace shortages were starting to become more common, and recruitment and retention was becoming more difficult. And it became utterly clear when the pandemic hit in March of 2020 that there was a disproportionate burden placed on women anesthesiologists, especially dealing with work and family and caretaking responsibilities and suddenly homeschooling and increased financial insecurities. And coupled with all these stresses, there seemed to be an explosion of burnout and unfortunately an increase in suicide in women physicians in general. So in 2020, CSA president-elect Dr. Jeff Pogue, with all of this background, decided that we needed to establish first a task force on women physicians in anesthesiology to try and ascertain what we need to do to support and promote women into leadership, into membership, into our societies, and hopefully improve their satisfaction with their career trajectories. And within a year, we became a standing committee because really what we found is women, not only did they need leadership skill opportunities, they lacked opportunities for significant sponsorship and mentorship in order to promote them in their fields. And this had a negative effect on their career longevity. And we needed to find a way to encourage practice leaders to recognize that this was a real problem and to start working on eliminating biases, microaggressions, and this general environment of harassment to foster equitable and inclusive practice environments for women anesthesiologists, but also just to improve the health and welfare of the teams that are all being affected by working in an environment where harassment was considered part of the norm. So that's that's where we went. And actually the 2022 report from the American Academy of Medical Colleges that you discussed in the introduction was, I believe, work built upon the original National Academy of Sciences work to look and see, well, where in medicine are we having the problem? Medicine's sort of a broad field. How do we break it down? So they actually looked at all the specialties <laughs> And sadly, the highest rate of sexual harassment, both male and female, was experienced by anesthesiologists. And it was women that had the most harassment in that percentile, which was rather devastating. When that information came out, there was a lot of denial that this was a real problem. And even nationally, there were discussions that, well, this can't be right. This this can't be accurate. This doesn't happen at my institution. And so we, we've we been growing in our advocacy uh, efforts. We've been trying to come together to find ways to help our specialty grow and accept that there is a problem and find a way to start addressing this problem before it's too late. Great. Thank you so much for that. That was a lot. And that's, um, it's a, it also touched a little bit on what I had talked about in my last podcast with, with Diana Lautenberger that yes, it, it is definitely, uh, it's both anesthesiologists and that, that there is a lot of denial. And one of the first things that we can do to help prevent or help you know, mitigate the effects of harassment is to stop the denial. Can you, and and maybe what I'm going to do, I think, is ask Dr. Doyle, if you identify issues in your local, regional, or national organization, what advice would you give people, or how, how did you go about addressing these issues on a local and a, and a national level. And, and I'll ask Dr. Doyle, fully acknowledging that both Drs. Burghardt and Dr. Thompson were very involved in this process, both at the CSA and the ASA level. So thank you. One of the hardest things um, for all of us, but especially for women, is to figure out how the systems work. 
And whether that's your hospital system, your group, or the CSA or ASA, your professional societies. And I've been doing this long enough, started as a resident, that I do understand how the systems work. And I often coach people through the process. And the key really is that none of us should be working alone for these kinds of things. You need to have a coalition of like-minded people. And so this really came to a head with the leak of the Dobbs decision before it actually came out. And a group of us were very concerned about the implications of that for ourselves as women and for ourselves as physicians who care for women. Most of us do a fair amount of OB-related work. And really trying to figure out what should we collectively as a state or national association be doing or saying or planning. And when the Dobbs decision was actually finally released um, on that Friday in June, uh, end of May, I guess, in any case, ACOG's statement was released before the end of the day. SOAP's statement was released before the end of the day. The ACS had a statement that was released before the end of the day. That's the American College of Surgeons. The American right. College of Surgeons, yes. There was no statement from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And I reached out to the staff who would have been in charge of such a statement and was told that there were no plans to release a statement. And I thought that was a mistake. And I talked to Dr. Thompson and I talked to several other folks And we actually had a regularly scheduled CSA women's meeting the following Monday. And so we transitioned that from a committee meeting to a meeting of uh, several of us from across the country involved in in these kinds of things and committees that would be would be expected to be involved in such a decision from the part of the ASA. So we had representation from the Committee on Obstetrical Anesthesia, from the Committee on Well-Being, from the Committee on Young Physicians, from the Committee on Bioethics. And we invited the then president and president-elect of the ASA and two of the senior officers from the CSA to join us. And it became very evident that the then in office leadership did not want to do anything. And we basically, because we were a coalition of mostly women from across the country, said that that was not an acceptable solution and that they needed to make a statement. And we gave them a time limit. Time limits are good, deadlines are good. And they made a statement and then they sort of doubled down and made it worse. And it became evident that the way we were going to deal with this was not going to be with individuals, but it was going to be with dealing with the organization as a whole and with the committee structure of the ASA. And so that led to us creating six different resolutions that dealt with the annual meeting, that dealt with a revised statement, that dealt with looking at this going forward and creating the Ad Hoc Committee on Harassment and Civility and Disrespect and getting more people involved. And I have to thank Dr. Burkhart publicly because she wrote the primary draft of the revised statement, which was subsequently revised, as is always the case by by these things. And we came up with something that no matter what your belief and where you stood on the decision of Dobbs, everybody was willing to accept it. And the board of directors accepted it in August, and then the house accepted it overwhelmingly by about three to one. Uh, at at the House of Delegates meeting in in, uh, October that year. But the key was understanding how the process works and how resolutions can be written. And it is rare that a resolution comes from individuals at the ASA level. It is common at the CSA level. And we brought out five resolutions with individual names on them, and one came from multiple committees. The, The Ad Hoc Committee on Harassment was from academic medicine, driven in part by the AAMC report, as well as Committee on Young Physicians and the Committee on Wellbeing, and their chairs brought that forward. And five of the six were passed by the board in the House. The one that was not passed was dealing with specific issues at the annual meeting in 2022. And by the time, at the time we submitted it, 
between that time and the time we voted on it at the August board, many of the things we had asked for were suddenly now available for the annual meeting. So our we can't tell if they were going to do it without our push, but they did it for us. And so then the, the need for the resolution really wasn't there. It was a very intense about two week period while we were writing these and getting these going. Um, we found a lot of new friends became uh, from across the country. I had not met Dr. Burkhart before all of this happened. I've known Dr. Thompson and Dr. Agarwal for several years. I met new friends from the East Coast, from the Deep South, from the Northeast, from the upper, uh, you know, Northwest territories. I met, more people, I met more people through all of this than I've met in many of the years that I've worked with, with ASA as an officer and whatnot. And what I really think and want to emphasize is that a group of us together are always stronger than any one of us individually. And it's an exponential thing. It's not one plus one equals two. It's one plus one equals three. And, and you know, you get six of us together and we are worth 10 or 20. And so understanding how that works. And so my advice for, for other folks is if you have an issue like this, reach out to your colleagues, talk to people about it. And they may not agree with you completely, but but the disagreement is also valuable because you learn how to rephrase things. You learn how to how to what's going to trip you up and make it not happen at all. Yeah. I know that the then president did not expect our resolution to go through. And he definitely didn't expect it to go through with the margin that it went through with. But the membership is changing. And we are all realizing that this is very important. And this is not necessarily the end of what's going to be happening, depending on what we see coming through the courts or through the associations or through anything else. So this is how you get your organizations engaged. It's never going to be a solo job. You've got to have everybody involved. Right. Well, thank you very much for that. I want I I will probably circle back to a little bit more about the actual nitty gritty of the process because I think for those who've never done this, which I hadn't until I met all of you, um, that, that it, there's a there's a lot in there to unpack, which we're not going to get to all of it today. But I I would like to bring in Dr. Burkhart and talk about what she's been doing, um, and some of the work that she's been doing at Stanford to address issues around harassment. And then maybe if if we have time, we'll circle back more to the specifics on how what a resolution even is and how you go about like writing one, submitting one, et cetera. But Dr. Burkhart. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it was really awesome just now listening to uh, Dr. Doyle really, really take me back to that super exciting time when I learned how so many of these issues work, how you can actually get things done, truly having mentors like people on this call um, to help me understand the mechanics. I, I feel like it really enhanced my professional development. So anybody who's listening, you need friends who know what they're doing so that you can understand how to how to make effective change and you know then you get to make a bunch of cool friends along the way which is awesome <clears throat> so uh, like most women i have been sexually harassed in pretty much every job i've ever had i cannot think of a job that i was not harassed in and anesthesiology is unfortunately no different and uh, the data demonstrates that my experiences being harassed as an anesthesiologist are simply not unique. They are they are still the norm, despite how far folks may believe they're going. And as a as a bioethicist, I also tend to be the person that when people have a problem that they're not sure what to do with, they tend to come and see me confidentially to try to understand what their options are. And so, since becoming a faculty member at Stanford. I've really had to become more of an expert on the systems that work here, and not just things like Title IX, but human resources. Stanford's a huge organization, so there's actually multiple different groups that you have to understand. And so quite a few people have come to me with their concerns about being sexually harassed at work. And I, I do also want to just 
kind of make sure that we're all thinking about the same things. We're talking about sex-based harassment and sex-based harassment includes sexual harassment, include, includes sexual violence, and it includes gender-based harassment. And so those also include things related, for example, to pregnancy harassment, things related to lactation. These are all issues that are coming up in anesthesiology. And of course, for our colleagues who you know, identify as LGBTQ, these are all issues that are very much interrelated. And we would have to parse out this data, and I'd be very curious to hear what Ms. Lautenberg would say. But a lot of men in anesthesiology have reported that they too have experienced harassment. And my guess is that probably quite a few of those folks are folks who, who identify as LGBTQ, because we know that that population experiences a great deal more harassment than others, and that includes amongst women. And, and so, just to answer that question, sorry, really quickly. They didn't look at that specifically. So I know. they did not do I know that. They didn't. And, and to I looked <laughs> to confirm what you said, a lot of what they were looking at is not specifically like the sexual harassment of, hey, if you sleep with me, I'll give you this great grade. It, it it's a lot of the gender based, you know, put downs and oh, all women are or all men are or whatever, you know, whatever the the theory is. So they, just to confirm exactly what you're saying, that it's it's a mm. lot of this is gender based harassment, and it's not the out and out. So I think when I think Dr. Thompson said a lot of departments and a lot of denial around this doesn't happen in my department. This is never a problem in my department. Well, the bottom line is it was over fifty percent of women who reported it, and it was about close to 25% of men who reported it. So yes, it does happen in your departments or your groups yeah, and your practices. And part of what I, I want to make the connection for is I think that, you know, for example, in California, we have required sexual harassment training. You have to go through two hours. It's mandated by the state. But the reality is that a lot of this training does not necessarily, like people are pretty clear that, oh, I'm not supposed to touch people. I'm not supposed to offer sex for reimbursement. I'm not supposed to do those sorts of things. So the most obvious egregious things, people are like, well, of course I'm not doing those. But when we don't take all of those other ways that people are harassed seriously, if we don't take into account the nuance, then of course you have leaders in organizations, the vast majority of whom are men who have never experienced these things. They don't have any idea what you're talking about. It never happens to them. If they don't see it, they don't experience, how can it possibly be real? And what's, a, what's such a huge challenge is the reality is that women still live a very different experience. The, the, our experience of the world remains very, very different from that of men who, frankly, in general, not all men, but in general, are able to experience safety most places that they go. Mm -hmm. And that is not the experience that many of us have. Um, and so those are things that I think are really relevant in that data. I was so thrilled to see the connection. I mean, I'm not thrilled that anesthesiologists are burned out. I'm not thrilled that people want to leave practice, of course. But the reality is that there's a reason why women are the ones who are, who are expressing such a strong desire to leave academic medicine. If we are not welcome in these halls, if we do not see a place for ourselves in the future of this organization, as we are watching women, especially senior women, be marginalized and set aside, we're not seeing those women being having the opportunity to develop their careers further. That sends signals to women throughout the organization. It sends signals to women throughout the profession. And so, you know, it's not just being a woman, it's also all of these ageist things. So, you know, if you're young, you're considered malleable. It's, you can sometimes be seen as, oh, it's going to be great for you to build a career. And those expectations change as we age because we have an incredibly gendered society that sexualizes most of what we do, most of our existence as people in society. Thank you. That is, that's a lot <laughs> that all three of you have said. Right. I had all my questions laid out here and I'm like, woof, I gotta think about this. Um, uh, so, and this is really a question for all three of you. And that is, the first is, and I know, and I, I've heard all three of you say this, this is not an individual problem and it should never be an individual problem. And if you're the person being harassed, it should not be up to you to make the changes. Or if you're the person who's been talked to, you know, who's been confided in by the person who's been harassed, it should not be just up to you to make changes. So I think, and I, I know 
Dr. Doyle addressed it a little bit with with the resolution thing. So I'm going to circle back a little bit to that. But before we even get there, it's I think the question that I have really is how how do you recognize when there is a problem? Because honestly, I'm in the same department as Dr. Burghardt, and I didn't recognize some of the things that were happening in the same way that she did. That may be partly because I am older and I'm used to so much you know, quite frankly, garbage that's come our way because we just, when, when, you know, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Doyle and I are of similar generations, when we started medical school, we didn't really have an opportunity or a voice to object to some of the things we were exposed to. So some of it may be my own experience in that I just, I expect it. And so it doesn't phase me. It's not that it doesn't phase me. It doesn't, it doesn't alert me in the way it should. And maybe that's, that's more the issue is that it doesn't alert me in the way it should. So how do we as individuals, A, recognize that there's problems and then figure out how to bring in other people who can help us make changes. And I'll start with Rita Burgart and then. So um, Rita, what I, what I, I want to name what you have just talked about, which is how gender harassment, sex-based harassment, it is the water that we swim in. Yeah. We are surrounded by this all the time. It's not just you. And I was harassed throughout my residency too. And guess what? There was no way that anyone was going to do anything about that. Absolutely not. To be seen as a complainer, to be seen as a difficult woman, to marginalize my own career and my own future even if it was in the service of my safety? Absolutely not. And so for me, a big part of my development as a faculty member is because I'm an ethicist, I hold myself to a different standard to evaluate the water that we're swimming in and trying to draw attention to it and trying to name the things that we are experiencing so that other people can see them. And So certainly there is some of it that is generational because throughout your foundational career, you know, time in your career, it was simply anathema to even just mention it Right. Right. when there were so few women around. So there's a couple of things that I think are really useful for folks to understand in terms of understanding what the definitions are of of sexual harassment, of sex-based violence. Doing a little self-education is always really helpful. One of the things I think is really useful to recognize, there's a concept that was uh, defined by Dr. Jennifer Frade that's called DARVO, D-A-R-V-O. I wrote about it in an ASA monitor with uh, Dr. Stephen Bradley. And DARVO stands for Deny, Attack, Reverse, Victim, and Defender. And what that acronym is to help you understand is how, for example, if I am being harassed by, by by a person, that person in defending themselves may actually make their defense that I'm actually the one who did something wrong. They are themselves the victim and I'm actually the bad person. And you're going to start noticing it more now that I've told you about it. It is very highly utilized by, pardon me, it's very highly utilized by folks who are perpetrators of sexual assault. And we certainly see it um, in sexual harassment as well. The kind of cousin of that, the worst a different version is is actually institutional DARVO, where it's not actually just the person who's doing it to you, it's actually your employer. It's the organization that is supposed to care about you and protect you. When an organization uh, actually participates in that deny, attack, reverse victim and offender who says, oh no, you're actually the problem, You're you're the issue. So I think recognizing that both in individual interactions as well as in organizations is an incredibly valuable tool to really that whole naming and claiming of what it is that's going on. Also a resource from Dr. Jennifer Frade that I I strongly recommend folks check out is called the Center for Institutional Courage. It actually has a stepwise, uh, you know, 10 steps for you to take as an organization to ensure that your organization is supporting colleagues, is doing the right thing. You know, if we want to have morally upstanding and and, uh, morally strong organizations, we need to mean what we say and say what we mean. And if we're going to say, uh, you know, in our mission statement, how we care about diversity and we care about workplace safety and we care about psychological safety, well, guess what? Put your money where your mouth is and invest in those things in your organization as you build it. For the listeners, I am actually going to write like 
a summary, but more of an essay on our conversation. And I will try and include some of the resources that others have mentioned in that. So that will be in the CSA online first around the same time that this podcast is released. So hopefully if people are interested, they can, they can find that. Dr. Doyle, what would you say? What, what would your advice be? So one of the things that we're looking at with the ad hoc committee on harassment and civility and disrespect, and I will say the original task was just to create an ad hoc committee on harassment. And as and we specified members from several different other committees within the ASA. So we have representatives from ethics, from women, from well-being, from young physicians, etc. We realize that, that harassment there's a connotation and a denotation, and many people consider harassment very negative, but it has to be very big. You know, oh, well, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'll give you a good grade if you, if we have sex, that, that's an obvious one, but they don't see the incivility. They don't see the disrespect. And, you know, an example, a simple example of the disrespect is that they don't call me doctor. They call me Chris. Yeah. I mean, that, that's one that I think many women have, have had. Incivility can be, you know, rude, can be a whole variety of things. And so what we're working on from an organizational standpoint, because really what we saw was that the professional organization, the ASA, needs to support the individuals by providing some tools, by providing some structure. We are able to take many different ASA guidelines and statements to hospital administration and when they say, well, we don't want to do this. It's like my professional society says that you should. So you should. And that gives us something to work with, gives us a tool, an extra leg to stand on. We felt that we needed to do the same thing on this topic. And so we have spent some time working on our definitions so that we all agree when we say microaggression, we mean X. And when we say micro insult, we mean Y and some examples. And so that's part of our document that we're working on. And then the second part is is some guidelines um, for what people can do. And we're not trying to tell each group or hospital or organization exactly how to do it because we understand that there are there are going to be local issues that need to be taken into account. But if you've never considered something is a problem, and I've given you now some examples in my document, that may make you think twice about it. So as an example, there was a very long thread in the ASA community about I was going to bring that up. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. I really, I really had had to, I, I mean, I was very, very pleased. And I'm going to call somebody out by name because I'm very pleased with it. So Jeff Jacobs, who's the current Speaker of the House, who was the Vice Speaker at the time, um, is at Mayo, Florida. And he said, well, we pay everybody the same based on these criteria. Okay, that's fine. This is about the, the article about gender gap in payment. And then a few comments later, he came back and he said, I'm going to go double check to make sure that what I said is accurate. So it was enough to make him think that he better double check because what he was being told by HR may not have been true. I don't know what the outcome of that was. I don't need to know what the outcome of that was. But it was enough to make people think. And that's our goal is to make people think about how this could impact their department, their team, their colleagues, their home, um, burnout and retention and everything else. You know, it, it's a good 100000 or $150,000 to recruit a new, new physician for any position, faculty or, or private practice. It's not cheap. And and then you have all the, the lost costs associated. There are some estimates that have it at a half a million to a million. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I assume that varies on the field and the and the type of person, but yeah. there are estimates in some of the it's not academic true. journals that it's that it's up as high as half to a million yeah. to recruit. So, so recruit. in any case, so yeah. the committee is continuing its work. We we put a draft out basically to socialize it and get people's comments and, and things that they thought would be problematic or they thought would be we could explain better or whatever. And we've gotten comments back from uh, some of the, the core committees that, that are represented on, on the, this ad hoc committee, as well as some of the others. It was shared at the uh, House of Delegates this last October, and it will be coming to the House of Delegates this coming October in Philadelphia for a vote. Um, and I, given what we're seeing, I think that most people are going to be in favor of passing this 
with little to no additional editing because we're really trying to just set guidelines and guardrails and and give people tools to help them figure out what to do for their own facility. And again, to emphasize, this is not just about women in this particular, I mean, in any of this, it's not just about women. It's about everyone. Dr. Thompson, what are your, what are your thoughts or suggestions? Can I, can I make just one point course, about what you just said? Please, that this yeah. is not just about, you know, this, it's not just about women because what we actually need is for all of the men, especially the men who are in positions of power to recognize this has negative implications for you. Yes. Sex discrimination against women, against LGBTQ folks, it is bad for everyone, including those people who are in power. And so I just really wanted to make sure that we touched on that because I think that a lot of, a lot of um, men have been kind of protected from recognizing the ways that they too are actually harmed by by sexist policies, by gender-based violence, by incivility in the workplace. This is something about all of us. Yeah. Dr. Thompson? Well, to build on what Dr. Burgart just said and Dr. Doyle, it's negative for all of us, but it's also negative for our patients and good care. And I think that's the core, we practice medicine. Why do we want to make this change? Stay out of politics. This is a woman's problem. Maybe they're not suited for this job. You all, okay, you know, I'm in my 60s, so I grew up, as you say, swam in this water, and it was the air that we breathed, basically. But when you look at the effectiveness of teams, because you you don't work alone. The surgeon doesn't work by himself. His outcomes aren't just based on his skill with a knife. It, there's a whole team of people taking care of this patient, the anesthesiologist, the techs, the nurses, the support staff, the, the, the recovery staff, et cetera. And if you have an environment that's incivility is a nice word, I, I'll still say toxic. If you have a toxic environment, people are not focused on giving the best care possible. People are not communicating well enough amongst themselves to call out if there is a problem because they already live in fear and don't want to interact in that environment. And you don't just lose physicians, you also lose the staff that helps support the work that we do. So when we look at shortages in healthcare, yes, we have we have a major shortage of anesthesiologists, we have a major shortage of physicians, especially women, but we also have a major shortage of support staff that help us do our job well and help us take really good care of our patients. And I know there was one study and, and they showed that for team effectiveness, if a team was operating at, let's say, 90% effectiveness, just having an environment where there's verbal incivility or verbal harassment, the team's effectiveness was then measured afterwards, dropped to 60%. Do you, do you want to be a patient being taken care of in an environment where team members can't work collegially together to promote your best outcome? as an individual. And as Dr. Doyle said, yes, it comes, it really, when you're dealing with administrators and I've come from private practice, so I apologize. I'm a little bit jaded, but everything comes down to the money. Okay. It just is. So if you want anything done in a hospital to improve safety or improve your environment, you have to show them how it either makes money for them or saves money for them and improves efficiencies. So we also need to learn how to talk like, in the language where a CFO would understand, because they can't see dollars coming in and they see dollars coming in and dollars coming out. So if you make these changes, that's costing me money, okay? And training, whatever, I'm upsetting a, what we used to call rainmakers, people who brought a lot of money to the institution seem to get away with a lot more than people who weren't as powerful. And again, it came down to economics. If you can show them how you save money, as you said, between a hundred thousand and a half a million dollars to recruit and retain, and then lose those people is ridiculous. To have them jump from institution to institution, it doesn't create a stable team environment. It's not good for the institution, and there's a cost to that. So we need to figure out how can we quantify these costs, and then sit down with a balance sheet and say, if you make these changes, you'll see improvement in your bottom line. Bottom, sorry, bottom line, and here is how. Going back, though, to the water you say we swam in and we swim in currently, I'll, I'll admit when I was a trainee in residency in medical school, uh, you had to be one of the boys. And if you showed any weakness, if you showed any distress about something that they said, you weren't invited 
not just to the table, you weren't invited to the operating room table. And so they would say things in a Catholic institution that if you said those things now, people's ears would be burning. Um, but back then it was normal. And that's just the way it was. You had to just deal with it. That that was the sentiment. There was no one to report it to. It's like, if you deal with it, you'll be invited up to work with them and you become one of the boys. And that also is a defense mechanism because now you are no longer the target, but other people are still the target. So teaching us how to recognize we can't be one of the boys. We can't be complicit in this kind of interaction. And we have to learn how to, as they say, don't be bystanders, be upstanders, but to find the right timing and to say, you know, this is not appropriate. We may not discuss this right now in the middle of patient care, but we're going to discuss this and we're not going to just let this stand. And for those of us who do have leadership positions, it's m even more important for us to stand up because the person who isn't in a leadership position is far more vulnerable. So that would be my statements in regards to this conversation. There's so much to unpack here. It, yeah. So much to unpack. But yeah, we need to learn how to talk more like business people if we want to sell these programs. And I hate to say it, but we've got to sell these programs to get them going. And then we need institutionalized cultural change on a national level where we set up almost a bill of rights this is what we're entitled to. We're all entitled to a safe working environment. It doesn't matter what sex you are. It doesn't matter how you, how you are in the environment, whether you're a leader, whether you're a tech, whether you're the housekeeper, whoever, everybody's entitled to a safe environment. And certainly we are because we take care of patients and our patients are entitled to a safe environment. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's a lot, but. I, I, I think the other thing that, that's important for us to understand is that yeah, many of us are not employees. We're independent. We're contractors. We work for a different group. We're not employees of the hospital, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, even the folks that are at Kaiser or, or academic centers are usually not hospital employees. They're employees of the medical group. How you can report and how you can affect change is situational, and it does depend on what your relationship is. And it's very difficult if you're a contracted physician at a private practice hospital to deal with things because HR is not in your path. You, you don't deal with HR, so that doesn't help you. And if you try to report to HR, they'll blow you off because you're not an employee or they'll basically say that you're just complaining. And so having an alternate source to, to, to talk to and report to, whether it's through CSA or ASA or a committee or just you know a group of friends that you can vent to, but then also can give you some feedback is really helpful. And that's the other thing that we're really talking about with this ASA ad hoc committee is to come up with a toolkit to give people, and it may not be that, you know, I may have the toolkit and Dr. Thompson comes to me and says, I've had this problem. And then, well, here are the tools and let's help you and let's get you some help. And, and do we need to bring in somebody from outside to help be the neutral person? And so I know Dr. Burkhardt's going to say something about that. Well, you know, one of the things, especially for folks who are working in an environment like you've described, right, you're an independent practitioner, you don't have access to human resources. What is really important for folks to do, not only in that scenario, but honestly, in almost any work environment, is sometimes you're in this place where you're like, I don't, I feel uncomfortable, but I don't know if this is a pattern of behavior yet. Email yourself. Contemporaneous documentation is always going to benefit you, especially if you're in a position where things have really escalated and you're looking to potentially even take legal action, having that contemporaneous documentation, even just emailing yourself, you know, your recollection of what took place, it can be really, really valuable. Even if you never end up taking any sort of legal action, it gives you the peace of mind to be like, oh, this is a pattern. I'm not the crazy one. Because you, we all know that once you start to try to point these things out, you become the scapegoat mm -hmm. and people try to make it so that you're the problem. Again, getting back to that Darvo issue. So I would just say, always have in your back pocket, even if you just do a little bit of contemporaneous documentation, it gives you reference, it gives you um, evidence for later on, should you need to get legal advice or advice from other factors, it's gonna help you in terms of kind of understanding your situation even for your own benefit. 
Mm -hmm. Dr. Burgart, I wanted to ask you um, one quick question. We're we're getting on in time, and I I don't want to take too much longer because I don't I you know want to be respectful of everyone's time. But what you're um, you're at a place like Stanford, which is a big institution and very committed to to many uh, many efforts to try and improve student faculty life. It, what, are there some specific things that you are working on with the groups at Stanford um, to try and address the issue, other than the course, which looks fascinating, by the way, on on sexual harassment? And is that is that for undergrads or is that a medical school level course? That's or, an undergraduate. It's an undergraduate, it's an undergraduate course. class, which is great. Yeah. So are there any other specific things that you are doing, want to be doing, um, you know, have your like aspirational goal of, I would love to be doing this, you know, now in order to affect this kind of change. Yeah. So anything you could share on, on, um, on your work there? Yeah. My, my dream project that I really want to get going is to work with the folks at, at Vanderbilt who collect, you know, really national level data on patient complaints and complaints from coworkers. I want to analyze that data and I want to look at sensitive medical exams that patients are experiencing because I have I have a strong suspicion that we will see similar patterns to other behavioral issues that we've seen in that data uh, related to physician behavior. Uh, one of the issues that I speak nationally about is physician sexual assault, so physicians who sexually assault their patients. It's an immense violation, of course, of our patients. And there's a lot of data demonstrating, you know, people are assaulting their patients, they're probably also assaulting people in the hospital. So being that recognition that these are all related issues, they're all incredibly important. You know, for myself, it's it's not a secret. I've, I've posted about it on social media. I've given public talks about it. I was publicly sexually harassed um, at an event at my place of work by another anesthesiologist. And it was something that was witnessed by a lot of people. And and. I felt that I was in a position in my career that I had enough social cachet within my group, that I had enough strong relationships across the organization, that I was able to say, I insist on a safe workplace, I demand a safe workplace, and this needs to be addressed. That's not something that every single person is going to feel comfortable or safe to do to these points that, um, you know, that all three of you have really brought up about your own experiences. I'm really fortunate that when I went to the leadership in my group, they listened. We need leaders that we can actually push to do the things that are important, to do the hard things. We need to, so it's one thing if you say, oh, we want our leaders to be brave. Well, guess what? If you're not there to demand that they be brave, to say, I'm looking to you, our group is looking to you to be a leader, Mm -hmm. show our group what leadership looks like. That's a really powerful message for a leader. I think our leaders want to do good work. They want to um, have a community that is able to function. They don't want anesthesiologists quitting the group and leaving. They don't want to have to create more costs that require recruiting more people and training more people. And when you get to that issue about the bottom line, it helps when we push our leaders to say, hey, this is what leadership would look like. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to be brave? Are you ready to be courageous? That's an incredibly powerful message. The other thing I think is really important, um, I wish we didn't need whisper networks. I, I wish that it wasn't necessary for us to just like whisper to each other about who the baddies are. The reality is that those are things that you can do every day in your practice that can actually help to protect other people in the environment. You know, you may or may not be able to get somebody out of the organization who's doing creepy things, who's sexually harassing people in the group, but by actually talking about it amongst each other and saying, hey, that's not okay. I saw what happened. Are you okay? If I see him talking to you again, I'm going to come and I'm going to interrupt. Is that, is, that, is that okay? There are things that we can do to support each other. So that sort of pro-social gossip remains really, really valuable. I don't see that going away anytime soon. I, you, know, you asked me about what work I was doing. I'm really focused on my class. I love teaching this class. I'm just so blessed that um, Professor Michelle Dauber, who came up with it, um, invited me to co-teach it last year, and I'm, and I'm taking it over. It's an incredible privilege to be able to work with a lot of young undergraduate students who are learning about 
sexual assault on college campuses because it's a huge issue. Academic medicine is a lot of our hospitals are on college campuses. So just bringing that to everyone's attention, that's also a big issue. So I continue to do this work. I continue to find um, doing work that, that really elevates justice within our profession to be profoundly meaningful to myself, but also to others. Um, and I actually just, I have a paper that just came out today with Dr. Caitlin Sutton, who's uh, in Texas, another one of our, one of our friends. Um, and it's about the use of chemical restraint in obstetric surgeries and our obligation to really protect patients. And the reason why we were inspired to write this is because of the Dobbs decision and the fact that um, forced and compelled procedures are likely going to be a greater risk that our patients face. So if anyone's interested, I'll make sure that Rita has a link to that. Okay, great. Excellent. I, I wanted to finish up really quickly um, by asking Drs. Doyle and Dr. Thompson uh, kind of a, a little bit more because I knew nothing about ASA resolutions, CSA resolutions. What's that? What does it do? Why Why would I be interested in that? If maybe if either of you or both of you could give a summary of what that process is um, and what people hope to achieve like, you know, what is a resolution and why would I, why would I want to try and co-author one? I understand I need to bring in other committees and whatnots, but if I see something that is of interest to me, how do I go about doing that? And what is it? And maybe either one of you can go first. Yeah. I, I know I promised I would, I would <laughs> say names for so, so, so a resolution is a document where you give some sort of background, which is the whereas this is true and whereas this is there. Whereas the AAMC has said that anesthesiology has the highest rate of harassment among all the specialties. And whereas um, NAS uh, STEM says that more women are leaving medicine than not. And whereas this paper in Anesthesia and Analgesia that just came out two days ago says that there's a mid-career stall for women. Therefore, be it resolved. So it's, it's structured that way. The whereas is all go away in the end, but they give you the background for why you're doing what you're doing. Therefore, be it resolved that the American Society of Anesthesiologists creates an ad hoc committee on harassment. And the members, and therefore, further be it resolved that the members of that committee will include representation from the following committees: well-being, young physicians, women, blah blah blah. That essentially is the sort of uh, resolution we wrote to get the ad hoc committee created. But that's the typical sort of thing you're doing. You see a problem, you explain what the background is, why you think it's a problem, and then you ask for something to be done. And the something can be right create a committee, the something can be write a white paper or a guideline, um, and you can, you don't have to necessarily do it right then and there, you can send this to the appropriate committee to write a guideline. That would be a perfectly acceptable resolution, the resolved thing. One of the others that we had was to foster um, remote participation in the annual meeting not just limited to, to COVID and pandemic related issues, but to foster that. And so we actually, based in part on what happened to a, a young physician and, and annual meeting, that, that the ASA uh, staff be instructed to research technological solutions that would allow for remote participation in meetings, to facilitate and have a consistent, transparent policy about how remote participation would or would not be allowed. And if it was not going to be allowed, then it was not going to be allowed for anybody. Didn't matter who you were, or it was going to be allowed for everybody, or there were going to be criteria you had to meet that would be clearly defined. And so it would be ad hoc. Clarification, you're talking in that situation about presenters, not for the audience members. Right? Right. Yes, for yeah. presenters. Yeah, that's correct. And, and so, but, but so you can specify how much you want and, and you can include other things like with the ad hoc committee on harassment with a report back at X, a report back at the next board meeting with a report back at the next house of delegates. And for the ad hoc committee on harassment, we said with, 
We didn't say to have a document ready, but a report of some sort. Here's where we stand. Here's what we want to do. We'll be back next year. And, 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 and in that case, the request of our report was also to be reappointed for another year because the work was not done. And so, so as I said, deadlines are good. Putting a timeline expectation in some of these things is very helpful. Otherwise, they tend to sometimes fade away because people get, I mean, we all get busy. If it's not on your to-do list, you know, it doesn't get done. So that's the basic process. For the ASA, most of the time resolutions come from members of the board of directors, such as myself, or from committees. And they're part of a committee report. It's a report for action. And sometimes it's just a report for action. It's not a formal resolution. For the CSA, most resolutions come from individuals, and they are most often two or three individuals who somebody reaches out, who else would be interested in helping to write it and co-author it? Talk about the pros and cons, figure out, you know, whereas this is a good thing, but whereas this is a bad thing, and so res resolve, we think we should do this. Um, there are lots of different ways you can do it. The big thing is, is that it's rarely wise to do it as an individual alone without somebody else at least proofreading and, and getting feedback. Uh, the ones for the ASA, although they were officially co-authored by four, there was a group of about two dozen of us that were working on all of them. And we picked and chose who was going to be the lead author and who were going to be the supporting authors um, in part to get some diversity geographically, um, but also in part people had more interest in one or the other. So, Dr. Thompson, the CSA process pretty much is uh, is almost the same as the ASA process, as Dr. Doyle just said. Uh, obviously, individuals, members of the House of Delegates, or members can you know put forth uh, they would like to create a resolution. But I I believe that you shouldn't be disappointed if your resolution does not pass uh, because it may not. Because it's also open now to debate on the House of Delegates floor. And the good thing about that is it opens the conversation about the issue. And maybe this resolution isn't quite what the House of Delegates believes will be good for the society and for the membership. But that doesn't mean that it can't be referred to a committee of the president's choice, that it can't be brought back in a different format at the next House of Delegates. And as Dr. Doyle was saying, a coalition of support is so important. So reach out to the I'm the district director for District 3. You, When you are a member of CSA, you have not only a district um, director, you have a forum director um, reflecting your practice type. You can reach out to them and say, I, I think this is concerning. I think this is important for our membership. And I'd like to be directed perhaps to a committee where you can discuss with a committee that might have some expertise on this how to structure a resolution, uh, how to approach this issue, and how to gain support. You want people to rise and speak in favor of your resolution during the House of Delegates. You don't want to be the lone voice there. And you don't want to catch people by surprise. That Nobody likes surprise and sudden change. So the more that you interact at our meetings, the more that you interact mm -hmm. on committees, uh, and you have these conversations, discussions, maybe in an informal way, is how you garner more support for your resolution. You have to lobby it in some ways, and we can help you do that. And if you can connect with somebody who is in a leadership position, who can help champion your resolution, even better. So uh, that would be my advice. The nice thing about our organization is we're pretty open. And if you have an issue and we're not the expert, we know somebody in the state of California who is that you can speak with and find out, you know, where you can move with your ideas. It's a great, it's a great opportunity actually to gain sponsorship and mentorship. And it doesn't have to be within your institution. Circling back a little bit to what Dr. Burgart said, it's great to have people know and help you within your institution. But if you are in a private practice and you don't know who to talk to because you're afraid of retribution, by having a network of people at other like institutions, you could talk to somebody else in a private practice and say, you know, am I just being too sensitive? I, I, I'm experiencing this. Explain the situation to them. And they're not in the forest. They can help you look at the broader picture and recognize yeah, that's not okay. It's not okay at our institution and, and it's not okay at your institution. And let's see if we can help you deal with this. Um, so 
I, I, being a member of your professional society, I think is so important because it just gives you that support. So I'm glad you all three brought that up because actually one of our future podcasts is going to be on mentorship and sponsorship. So stay tuned for that. Before we go, I'd like each of you to, if you have any last minute comments, we'll try and keep it short. But um, starting with Dr. Doyle in the middle, the middle of my screen, I should say. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Any last minute things that we haven't covered that you'd like to say? And then we'll go to Dr. Burkhart and Dr. Thompson and then we'll start. Join your join your professional society mm-hmm. and feel free to reach out to any of the officers at the CSA. You can reach out to me directly. You can reach out to Dr. Thompson, um, whether or not you're in district three. Um, and we will make the connections for you to the people you need to know. Um, Dr. Burgart, last minute thoughts and comments. For all of the anesthesiologists out there, you deserve a safe work environment. You deserve to be comfortable at work the way that so many other people have had the privilege of being comfortable at work. And if there's anything that I can do or that uh, we can do through the CSA that would help you to achieve that in your workplace, please let us know. And Dr. Thompson. Well, I, I, I just want to point out that everything we've talked about today is the tip of the iceberg. A lot of these studies just focused on academics and things that are happening to us amongst our colleagues, but it's so much broader than that. And it doesn't even look at private practices and other practices across the state and across the nation. You are not alone. You are not the minority. You are not crazy. You are not weak. You are not too sensitive or too emotional. This is real, and we want to reach out to all of you and help you find ways not to cope with this, but to actually get rid of this. We talk about the Me Too movement. I want the Nevermore movement. Nevermore are we going to accept working under these conditions and feel helpless. Nevermore. And all of us here, there's a network of people here that can help you get through this. And together we are strong and we are the majority now, not the minority. Wow. That was really powerful from all three of you. And that was the Nevermore Pro movement. I'm, we're going to start a hashtag on that. That's amazing. (laughs) Thank you all so much. And thank you to the listeners out there for joining us for another episode of Vital Times, the CSA podcast. And um, we hope to see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.